Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. We would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us on Patreon. Please check the link in the description for more details. Finally, we would like to express our gratitude to Feedspot for including our channel into their top 20 YouTube channels on economics. Thank you very much for that shout out. But without further ado, my name is Sava, and today we're gonna discuss market timing, a crucially important yet often overlooked aspect of portfolio management and a quite promising source of outperformance and abnormal returns. Something that you can successfully use potentially to bid the market by exploiting your foresight and superior forecasts. And traditionally, when we think of funds, investors, portfolios beating the market, we immediately start thinking about alpha. Well, alpha is fine and good. It's mostly associated with investment managers picking undervalued stocks that deliver positive risk-adjusted returns. But it needn't be the whole story. For example, if you are an active portfolio manager, it's very unlikely that you just pick stocks that you deem undervalued and stick with those. It's most likely that you actively move your money from asset to asset or even from asset class to asset class. And here, it needn't be the case that you picked undervalued stocks. It can be the case that you just forecast market movements correctly and invest aggressively into risky assets when you expect the market to go up and disinvesting from risky assets and staying in cash or government bonds, risk-free assets, or even hedge assets and safe haven assets we have discussed in the previous video, when your forecasts tell you that the market is likely to go down. If you correctly anticipate such market movements and actively move your money accordingly, you can beat the market, extract abnormal returns, even having a zero or negative alpha. And sometimes this can be even more important than picking undervalued stocks. But how important is it exactly to explain the performance of most prominent hedge funds or investment banks? Well, today we are looking at exactly that. We have got data on seven prominent investment banks, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Citigroup, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank and Barclays. All of those have at least a listing on New York Stock Exchange. Well, some of those are primarily listed in Europe, but at least one listing they have on New York Stock Exchange. And we will consider how important is market timing in terms of explaining the fluctuations of their corporate value. Because as they, those are investment companies, or at least they have significant or substantial investment divisions, their corporate value should reflect the net asset value of their portfolios, at least closely following it. So from their stock price fluctuations, and their relationships to movements of the market, proxied here by S&P 500 as usual, over the period of 10 years from mid-October 2010 until mid-October 2020, we'll be able to extract what is the contribution of market timing and alpha to the performance of these seven investment banks. Well, first of all, what we can do is we can see how well did they perform over these 10 years. To do that, we can divide the total return index at the end of our sample period by the total return index at the very start of our sample period, raise it to the power one-tenth as we have a 10-year period, that would give us annualized return, and subtract one. And we can enforce this formula and drag it across our seven investment banks and the market and see that, well, some of those performed exceptionally poorly. Primarily Deutsche Bank, well, we all know about the scandals and the issues they had with risk management lately, uh, but also Credit Suisse and Barclays also had a negative annualized return. The only bank that delivered a return in excess of S&P 500 was actually JP Morgan, while Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs and Citigroup delivered positive returns, but well below that of the market. So overall, it has been a pretty bleak decade for investment banking. But what allowed JP Morgan to achieve this rare outperformance, at least surpassing all of its 
close competitors we consider here. Was it alpha? Was it the fact that JP Morgan asset managers were correctly picking undervalued stocks? Or was it because JP Morgan asset managers could correctly predict where the market is going and move their money accordingly due to active portfolio management and market timing? Well, that's what we're gonna investigate just now. Well, as it is often in finance, a model that can measure some important concept is most often just a clever generalization of the well-known capital asset pricing model that relates the expected return of a stock or an asset in general to the return of the market. And obviously, in the general case, those are excess returns, so net of the risk free rate. But as we have daily data, the impact of the risk free rate on the returns is negligible, so we can omit it from our analysis. So we can relate the asset return to the return of the market, to the beta of this particular asset, to its alpha, and the rest, the unexplained volatility, would be captured by the disturbance term epsilon. Well, here, in this framework, we will be able to measure how well does the asset perform in terms of its alpha, in terms of risk-adjusted performance, and how risky is the asset in terms of market risk, in terms of systematic risk, in terms of its beta. But by augmenting the Kappa model with market return squared, we would be able to see how well the asset performs, or the portfolio performs, or the investment fund, in that case an investment bank, performs when we consider the impact of market timing. Because if we introduce the market return squared into our equation, we would be able to see, does the fund do remarkably worse or remarkably better when there is a strong movement in the market in either direction? And that's what the square term captures. If this coefficient gamma, the market timing coefficient, is positive, it means that the manager of the fund, or uh, asset managers in an investment bank, correctly anticipate stock market movements and invest in risky assets, leverage their balance sheet, or leverage their portfolios when they correctly predict that the market will go up, and disinvest from risky assets when they correctly predict that the market will go down. If it's negative, that's the other way around. It means that you incorrectly predict where the market will go, overexpose yourself during bearish periods, and have some foregone upside during the bullish period. Well, that is how one can approach this issue econometrically. To measure those coefficients, alpha, beta, and gamma, alpha being the measure of stock picking ability, beta being the measure of systematic market risk, and gamma being the measure of market timing ability of a particular asset manager, we can uh, measure those using linear regressions. But first, we need to calculate daily returns of our investment banks, the benchmark, and the squared benchmark return. So first of all, calculating the returns. Total return index today divided by the total return index yesterday, minus one. Drag that across all of our investment banks plus the benchmark. Bottom left click it all the way down, and then calculate the return of our benchmark of our market, as in B500, squared to get our estimations of market time and ability in linear regressions. And again, bottom right click this formula all the way down across the sample. Now we have to estimate a linear regression with the return of the market and the return of the market squared for each of our investment banks. So we need to select a two by three array because we need, first of all, the coefficients and the standard errors. And we have got three coefficients to estimate. We've got two explanatory variables market return and market return squared for beta and market timing respectively. And we also need our constant alpha, so three columns. Now we can just enforce the Linus function and as our y's, as our dependent variables, we can select the returns of Morgan Stanley over here. And as our independent variables, we can select those two arrays, Q and R, with the S&P 500 return and S&P 500 return squared. We do need our constant because that's our alpha that we care about quite a lot. So we press 1 over here and we need to report the additional statistics because we want to get the standard errors to determine statistical significance. So we put 1 here as well, close the parentheses and enforce this formula using shift control enter and here we get our regression output. So we can see that first our market timing coefficient is positive 
meaning that uh, in terms of uh, asset management, active portfolio management, and moving money according to your market forecast, well, uh, Morgan Stanley asset managers are doing quite well. But are they doing significantly well? Well, let's figure it out by applying the usual t-test. First of all, we need to calculate the t-stats by dividing the coefficient by the respective standard error, dragging it across, and then applying the uh, p-value by using the two-tailed t-distribution. And we input the absolute value of the t-stat. And as a number of degrees of freedom, we need to consider that we have got 2,516 observations, but we have reduced the number of the degrees of freedom by three, as we have three coefficients to estimate, so minus three. But regardless, if your number of the degrees of freedom is quite large, the selection doesn't really impact the result. So if you have more than uh, 50, 60 degrees of freedom, any additional degree of freedom does not really impact the significance that much in terms of calculating the p-value from the t-stat. But it's always nice to be extra precise. So we can close the parentheses, enforce the formula, and drag it across. And here we see that, first of all, the alpha of Morgan Stanley is negative, but it's insignificant, meaning that um, asset managers of uh, Morgan Stanley are not spectacular, but not really terrible at stock picking. They are doing uh, stock picking roughly as well as you would have expected them to do if they were doing it randomly. Obviously, there is a positive beta that is actually quite a lot higher than one, meaning that Morgan Stanley is either very leveraged in terms of its investment portfolio or is investing in terms of its investment banking activities into assets that are quite a lot riskier than the market at large, at least uh, judging by the market risk exposure, the systematic risk exposure proxied by market beta. But most interestingly, market timing is also significantly positive, meaning that asset managers at Morgan Stanley do accurately forecast where the market will move and withdraw or invest additional funds into risky assets accordingly, meaning that market timing potentially is the most important feature that contributes to the uh, Morgan Stanley's financial performance. Now we can do exactly the same procedure for each and every of our investment funds by just copying this formula, pasting it over here for Goldman Sachs, dragging this column with the dependent variable to represent Goldman Sachs returns, again enforcing it using shift control enter, and reapplying the T stats and the P values. Uh, as we have correctly referenced all the cells, if we just copy and paste over here, it will recalculate all of the t-tests correctly. And now we can just proceed with doing it for every single of our investment banks. Now do JP Morgan, and that's something we are actually quite interested about, because JP Morgan is the only bank that showed superior performance to S&P 500 over this 10-year period. Then let's do Citigroup, and here we can actually just manually correct the array with the dependent variable from L to M, as we know where it's going to move. And here we, for the first time, see negative market timing, mean it's not universal for investment banks to correctly anticipate where the market will go. Now we can consider Credit Suisse and correct M to N, again moving the array with the dependent variable one to the right once more and calculating the t stack and the p-value and for the final two banks Deutsche and Barclays again now it's column O and for Barclays finally it's column P and what do we see here well first of all None of the banks that we, are, we have considered, at least, have significantly positive alphas. All the more so, none of those have a, a positive alpha, even if we talk about insignificant coefficients. However, some of them, namely Credit Suisse and Deutsche, have significantly negative alphas, meaning they have picked assets that have grossly underperformed the market. Do they provide for it? by being better 
at market time. Well, Deutsche Bank is not market timing at all. So roughly we could say that as an investment bank, Deutsche is more passive without moving funds from one asset class to another to gamble on its forecasts of market movements, while two other underperforming banks, Credit Suisse and Barclays, have notably negative coefficients here for their market timing, and they're remarkably significant both at 1% confidence interval. That means that asset managers at Barclays and Credit Suisse incorrectly banked on their forecasts and either have forgone a lot of upside from bullish market periods or have overexposed themselves to market risk during the bearish periods, which contributed to their quite poor performance over the past 10 years. If we look at other examples, we can see that JP Morgan, the best performing investment bank in our sample, actually also has positive market timing that is surpassed only by that of Morgan Stanley and also has quite uh, close to zero alpha, with it being negative but very low in magnitude, as well as quite low, by the standards of our sample at least, beta. That corresponds to investment attractiveness of this investment bank over the past 10 years. If we represent our results graphically, plotting alphas and market timing ability on a scatter plot, we can see that there are three uh, banks that perform quite poorly, and those are Citigroup, Credit Suisse, and Barclays, with um, poor market timing contributing to their demise, at least in terms of the stock price. Deutsche Bank uh, stays as an outlier over here, as, as we all know, Deutsche Bank has suffered generally because of poor stock picking, poor asset allocation, and not because of poor market timing, and that is why it stays over here um, alone to some extent. And the three banks that are generally the most successful from our sample, especially JP Morgan, are the banks that have an alpha of relatively close to zero and market time and ability that is positive and in case of JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley, statistically significant. And that is what has driven the differences in performances of seven most prominent investment banks over the past 10 years. We can see that none of them had positive alphas, but some of those had positive and significant market timing ability of their asset managers, meaning that in investment banking, it can be quite hard to constantly allocate your capital to undervalued assets, but it's reasonably easy, I mean, not for some of the banks, but for some of the banks, it can be relatively easy to correctly anticipate market movements and allocate your capital towards either risky assets or risk-free assets accordingly. And that's all there is for market timing and measuring it using linear regressions with applications to investment banks. Please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business economics or finance you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much and stay tuned.